Hi class, welcome to the online session. Uh, I'm going to discuss on the last slides for pulmonary pathology. So I hope that you learned something from this. Okay, so we have a total of 10 slides for this section. Okay, so for our first slide, this would be slide 140. This is labeled as emphysema. So emphysema would refer to the irreversible destruction or irreversible enlargement of the air spaces that is found distal to the terminal bronchial. So it means that it would affect the, uh, the smallest bronchioles, the respiratory bronchioles, as well as the alveoli. Okay? So the reason for this would be the presence of infections, presence of inflammations or inflammatory conditions, oxidative stress, the presence of uh, overproduction of proteases that would overcome the antiproteases. So there's an imbalance. So there are four types of emphysema. The first one would be called the centriacinar, which would mean that it would affect the proximal uh, proximal part okay and that would involve the respiratory bronchioles and would spare the alveoli so this is seen among smokers so always remember that one central assigner emphysema would be seen in smokers and then we have the pan assigner which would involve both the proximal and distal portion involves the respiratory bronchial and the alveoli and this would be seen in alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, wherein there's an imbalance between the proteases and the antiproteases. Number three is the paraceptal. So this would uh, affect the distal portion, the alveoli. So this would be closer to the pleura, and this would be the source or the cause for pneumothorax. The last one would be irregular type of emphysema. It would, uh, it would, mean that there's irregular involvement. It can be antacinar, it can be centriacinar, or it can be paraceptal. And this is associated with scarring or fibrosis. So histologically, you look at the uh, appearance of the alveoli, they are irregular in, in their formation. So this would be large, the spaces would be large, the septa would be very thin out, and you can see evidence of the destruction. Okay, there would be the uh, separation of the alveoli. So there's destruction of the alveolar septa in this case. So this is emphysema. So kindly read more about emphysema, especially the one that differentiates, the tabulation that differentiates between emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Okay. Number two, we have uh, 136. So this is bronchiectasis. So if the emphysema would involve the smaller uh, air spaces, the bronchiectasis or, or bronchiectasis would involve the larger air spaces. So we have the permanent dilation of the bronchi and larger bronchioles. Okay. And uh, when we cut it grossly, the specimens would appear to have several cystic spaces, similar to what we would find here. Okay. So what are the reasons for the bronchiectasis? So when we say bronchiectasis, this would refer to the permanent dilation of the bronchi and bronchioles. There can be destruction of the smooth muscle and the elastic tissues associated with chronic infection, necrotizing infection, uh, the presence of an obstruction, okay, that would be uh, proximal to this area, uh, like the presence of tumor, the presence of foreign bodies, the presence of mucus, even the presence of hereditary conditions that would cause the retention of, of particles like primary ciliary dyskinesia, the presence of Carter-Jenner syndrome, Autoimmune diseases can also cause bronchiectasis, like autoimmune diseases, like uh, the presence of SIE, lupus erythematosus, 
inflammatory bowel diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, even transplantations. Okay? So, here is a dilated lumen, a dilated bronchial wall. There is a lot of inflammatory cells in the area here. Okay. Mm, stratification, this is pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated epithelium. Okay. Um, so, so far, those are the things that we will see or appreciate in this particular study. Okay. Dilated lumen in the presence of chronic inflammation. Okay. So, next slide is slide 141. So, this is sarcoidosis. So, sarcoidosis is a systemic granulomatous disease. It would uh, affect uh, the lymph node most, most frequently involved organ, and then the lung, and then we have the eye, the skin, and then we have the skin and the liver. Uh, this one would be the lung. This is of, of unknown etiology. It uh, presents with a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction wherein it uh, elicits a cell-mediated immune response. Uh, histologically, we would see the presence of uh, an accumulation of CD4 cells. Okay? Uh, and we have T helper, T helper 1, uh, T helper cytokines to be uh, increased. So histologically, what we would see here would be the presence of granulomas. Uh, the type of granuloma here is non cascading type. Okay. So here we have the presence of nodular formations. Uh, we have the presence of epithelial histiocytes. And then we also would see the presence of uh, Langhans type giant cells. So this is sarcoidosis. So next we have uh, 143, uh, this is anthracosis or silicosis, so slide 143. So this is a form of pneumoconiosis that we would see among coal workers, miners, and uh, this is attributed to inhalation of coal dust that would present with uh, where uh, dark pigmented uh, structures actually these are macrophages that would engulf the coal dusts okay. uh, there's another uh, vision here which is called silicosis so this is the area of the silicotic silicosis the silicotic nodule would present with hyaluronized uh, nodule collagenous scar formation uh, wherein you have a whirling pattern we do not see the crystals we do not see the crystals and uh, we have hyaluronized collagenous scar so by polarizing microscope uh, we would be able to highlight the presence of by, by refringent silica nodules Biofringent silica nodules. So, again, this would be the silica nodule with hyaluronic collagenous scar formation. Okay. So, what are you doing? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Next, we uh, have slide 177. So, slide 177 is uh, labeled as astrosclosis. Um, uh, this one would be associated with exposure to asbestos fibers, which in the previous decades has been used as uh, a form of insulation to our construction of buildings and houses. So, uh, the presence of asbestos fibers being inhaled would be a cause for chronic inflammation and can even be an um, a cause for the formation of a malignant lesion called mesothelioma. So, asbestos fibers can be identified as having a uh, uh, beaded rod like this one. You have the presence of 
these beads and it has a golden brown color and this can be engulfed by macrophages like this one they are engulfed by macrophages the adjacent uh, areas would show the presence of macrophages uh, the presence of mononuclear cell infiltrates like plasma cells and lymphocytes so this would elicit a chronic inflammatory state okay so this is asbestos we are going to take up another slide which is related to asbestosis and that would be mesothelium next slide we are now going to the malignant lesions okay slide what slide 48 is squamous cell carcinoma i'm sorry this is slide one sorry, sorry. so slide 148 is squamous cell carcinoma um if you remember what is the lining epithelium of the bronchus is it stratified squamous epithelium or a pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. So it is a pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. However, if our patients would smoke a lot, okay, it would cause metaplasia. Okay. So squamous carcinoma would be seen in the setting of squamous metaplasia because of smoking and then is associated also with squamous metaplasia as with squamous uh, with dysplasia like in this case you have dysplasia it is limited to the basement membrane and then if you proceed to the lower portions you would now already see the presence of invasive nests into the stroma okay so this is now squamous cell carcinoma uh, for squamous cell carcinoma, it is notably seen at the central portion. If you're going to look at the X-ray, MRI, CT scan, if the tumor would be located at the center where the main bronchi would be located or the, or, or the large bronchi, then usually that's the source for the malignancy because squamous cell carcinoma would be derived from uh, dysplasia and metaplasia. So it is associated with smoking, it's associated with P53 uh, uh, inactivation, and we would also identify for the presence of these squamous cells. With this one, is a mitotic figure. Uh, let us try to see the features for or characteristic features for a screen cell. One would be presence of nests. These are forming nests. Okay? When you have clusters or aggregates of cells that would be in solid or organoid pattern, that would be the nesting. And then another thing would be the presence of keratin. Although I think this you can see the presence of individual cell keratinization. You can see the presence of pink, okay, a pink or eosinophilic cytoplasm uh, in some of the cells. However, we do not appreciate the presence of keratin proliferation in this case. Uh, keratin proliferation would be a feature of a well differentiated tissue. Uh, you can also identify for presence of um, intercellular bridges. Okay. Although uh, the, those features are not present. Ah, here, this one is an intercellular bridge. You can see the presence of the ladder like appearance okay, that would attach cells. Uh, to one another, this would be the intercellular bridge. Okay, keratin, intercellular bridges are features or histologic features of squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, this one is a nest. Okay, 
So next we have slide 151. So this is adenocarcinoma. So, with regards to adenocarcinoma, uh, this is glandular. So, this is a gland. It, uh, let us try to... This, this is a gland. A gland. This is a nest or organelle pattern. So, this is the most common form of malignancy lang, malignancy in both men and women. It is peripherally, loca peripherally located, although it's some areas we can also see in if it arises from the bronchi then it is centrally located okay um, it is glandular again in pattern with presence of atypical cells with prominent uh, with uh, round dark nuclei prominence of the nucleoli and we can identify for several mutations in adenocarcinoma. One of them would be EGFR, which is the uh, used for target, targeted therapy. We also have the KRAS. However, if it's positive, it's associated with a worse prognosis. We also have ALK, ROS, FAT, and RPT. Okay. Next, we have small cell carcinoma. So for small cell carcinoma, okay, so this is a very aggressive malignant lesion uh, that we would see in the lung. Uh, it is associated with P53 and RB mutations, uh, associated highly with smoking. It is composed of small cells. If you're going to look at it on, on this particular view, you'll be saying, ah, look, doctor, this looks like uh, uh, a lymphoma. Okay? But histologically, it looks like a lymphoma. Okay? But uh, we would see the presence of small brown cells with scanty cytoplasm. Uh, you have the salt and pepper chromatin pattern. Okay? Finely granular. Uh, chromatin pattern, they would exhibit nuclear molding, which is very prominent in this case. Okay? When you say nuclear molding, it means that there's no overlapping of the nuclei to the other nuclei. So there's a space always in between the cells. So that is typical for small cell carcinoma. You can see the presence of nuclear molding. Okay? You can see the nuclear molding. So can we follow my cursor? Okay, you can see the presence of nuclear molding okay, in the cells. Um, so it can express PTHRP, which can be the reason for hypercalcemia in this case. And in 80% of cases, it will present with PCL2 uh, overexpression in 90% of cases. Next, we have bronchial carcinoid. So bronchial carcinoid is similar to uh, small cell carcinoma because histologically it would be composed of small cells. However, when you are going to look at the carcinoid, um, they are composed of cells that would show lobulated clustering. Okay? So they can be forming rosette patterns, tubular patterns, trabecular patterns. Okay. So unlike that of the small cell carcinoma, this would show a tubular pattern or lobulated clustering. Okay. So they are composed of small round cells with scanty to moderate cytoplasm. The appearance of the cells would be similar to that of small cell carcinoma. Okay. Uh, however, this one would be a, uh, a low-grade malignancy uh, it would manifest with uh, a carcinoid syndrome feature like diarrhea, facial flushing, and cyanosis. Okay? So always look at that. Very important to look at the high power, low power, and scanning view. If you're going to look at this area, 
then you would be thinking, ah, this is most probably small cell carcinoma. But when you look at the other area, ah, this one would look like, would look like carcinoid. Okay? So, our last slide for, the, for this session is the malignant mesothelioma. Okay? So, this is, uh, this tumor is not found in the lung, but it is, it is a plural-based mass. So, that is one clue already for you. If we say it's a plural-based mass, most probably it's mesothelioma or it's a metastatic lesion. Okay? So, malignant mesothelioma, you have to look at the history of your patient. So, what we have to look for? History of, of asbestos, okay, asbestos um, exposure. And then, we look at the appearance of the tumor cells. Usually, the tumor cells here would mimic adenocarcinoma. However, they are smaller in appearance. The tubular pattern would be smaller and the cells have uh, round, uh, not that dark nuclei, prominence of the nucleoli. Take note, these are mesothelial cells. Okay? So, what if these are simply mesothelial cell proliferation, which can happen? So, what we would see is what we would check is look for chromosome 9 P deletion. Chromosome 9 P deletion is in mesothelioma. However, if you have a plural based mass, most probably that would be a mesothelioma. Okay? Unless you have a very small thickening in the pleura and you want to identify whether it is really uh, mesothelioma. Okay. Uh, this type is epithelial in character. It mimics adenocarcinoma forming the tubular pattern. How do we differentiate this one from the other? Uh, for mesothelioma, it would be positive portal reddening, cytokeratin 5-6, and D240. Okay? So those are the slides that we have for this session. Uh, can you read your book? Uh, and then most probably we're going to have an evaluation practical exam. Okay? So, kindly study these uh, slides. Okay? And stay safe. Good night.